I'm a chemist and spe specialized in, in uh, physical chemistry, which is a terrible field. Yeah? And in that field, we, my group is working with uh, polymers, mostly biopolymers. Hello. And beside that, I am uh, responsible for a group in a research center called URM Research. And in that research center, we develop uh, sensor systems. And I will show you a little bit later uh, how this, in principle, how these sensor systems work and what we are doing there because it's one of my examples. Huh? And uh, it would be helpful for me if I uh, would hear from you what you are, what is your topic, yeah? what is your education, yeah? uh, because then I might be able to adapt myself a little bit to your needs, but I have no idea. I'm an industrial engineer. Uh -huh. I have my master's now. Mm -hmm. So I have a from electrical engineering and economics. So you will be able to, let's say, yeah. be a, and, and, uh, understand something about sensor systems. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. May I ask you? Um, oh, the same. Huh? Okay. Yeah. And you? Sorry? Law. Law. Okay. I will try my best. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I studied physics. Hmm? I studied physics. Physics, okay, then, okay. We will be able to understand each other. Yeah. Theoretical physics. Theoretical physics. I can't understand you, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you a story about the theoretical physics. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, civil engineering? Civil engineering, okay. Uh, media student. Hmm? Media student. A media student, okay. Then let me start this uh, joke about theoretical physics. I no, 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 this is a real story. I uh, had some work with uh, one of the theoretical uh, teachers here in theoretical physics. Yeah. Uh, hi, Zero. And uh, yeah, we, we discussed uh, how to set up a project, and we did that. And I told him, yeah, and for that and that parameters, uh, these and these parameters, we will measure as a function of the pH. The pH is if something is acid or basic. Yeah? For the lady studying mm -hmm. law. Yeah? Uh, and he looked at me and said, yeah, you can measure the pH. And I was somehow surprised because for a chemist to measure the pH is, is something like eating. What do you do all the day? Yeah? And he asked, you can measure the pH. Yes, we do it. Uh, usually it's our business. Yeah? Okay, and he was very surprised. And a couple of years and I thought, uh, what a stupid guy. Yeah? And uh, a couple of years later, I, uh, I had to do, and, and we did some research on pH measurement. And then I realized how complex it is. And then I had to say, the stupid guy, the two of us were me, not he. Right. So that's my experience with a theoretical phys physicist. Yeah. Okay, now from Silva, I know what he's doing. Hi, <laughs> Silva. Okay, let's go into that. Yeah. So I will speak about uh, the genesis of innovation, the general needs to do it, uh, that Nowadays, in innovation, networks are needed uh, and these networks should have some uh, properties. Yeah? So they should be able to withstand a certain load, a certain stress. So this kind of, of, uh, of uh, networks are called resilient networks. The word coming from physiology because People are either resilient to stress or not. Yeah? And the networks can do the same or have the same uh, properties. Yeah? And then we will speak about the product life cycle 
And because from there we have to see and we can see why innovation is needed. Huh? It's not something where, because uh, entrepreneurs want to earn more money, of course that is one reason. But there are many other reasons why innovation is needed. And then we will come to closed and open networks. Huh? Uh, closed and open innovation because they are very, uh, let's say, uh, like a handshake. Uh, they are very well connected or very intensively connected. And then we will discuss a few examples. So, but I cannot give you any hand or any things to work with your hands. It's I'm sorry, it's impossible. Uh, not with this topic. So these are the sources. Of course, I'm not an, an uh, theoretician in. in in innovation, I do it practically, and to teach, I took, uh, let's say, information from these guys here, and I did not always cite them, but here it's uh, combined that you see where the know-how comes from. So, what means innovation? Yeah, the classic picture of innovation. There is one uh, poor scientist on an old desk with an old chair. Yeah. Uh, looking through an old instrument, and around him are all the well dressed manager with his ties and expecting now new results which they can turn into uh, an innovative product or a process or an innovative organization uh, uh, to earn money. So that is the typical situation. Uh, and that is not a network at all, uh, it's uh, a poor single guy who uh, is always under pressure and you can see all of the research and development departments of, uh, of a company in the same situation. Yeah. Uh, they always hear from the management, you're too expensive, your uh, innovation comes too late, uh, you are not on time with the innovation and with the development and so on and so on. Yeah. So that is the classic situation. And now let's see what is an open innovation. Uh, Jess Pro is one of the guys who brought, I believe the word comes or the name comes from him, yeah? He brought this into the, into the, let's say, mind of the people, yeah? Open innovation is an interactive, distributed and dispersed innovation system. A nice sentence. What is the meaning, yeah? It is a cooperation in order to transfer ideas into innovation within horizontal and vertical networks. So it means networks between uh, research guys, between design people, between engineers, and also a network between the customer, between uh, the deliverer, between the producer, and Finally, again, uh, who brings the marketing guys and marketing people and the customers again. Yeah? So, uh, the idea is, and the practice is in many years, and I will be able to show this, that this is not a new process. Yeah? Uh, companies can and should use external ideas. Yeah? Ideas coming from outside, yeah? as well as ideas which were created inside their own R&D departments. Mm -hmm. And both internal and external passes or experts uh, should then design something to bring it on the market. And it must not always be good. It can be a kind of organization. Yeah? It can be something uh, which is uh, a virtual think, yeah? uh, like in the e-business, hmm? it can also be a process or a product. Yeah? With the product it's easier to understand, but it's also the same with other totally different uh, things. Think about uh, uh, windsurfing equipment. Most of the windsurfing equipment and the start of the windsurfing movement, I would say, did not come from an inventor in a company, uh, a designer in a company. It were people who, customer, uh, sports person, uh, who wanted to do that, who developed it, and finally they created a huge business. Uh, 
and that, that is a typical example for hello, hello, is a typical example for an, an open innovation. No? And we will go to these innovation cycles a little bit later. So at least this open innovation means that uh, not uh, the innovation, the discussion of ideas uh, does not take place in a closed psyche of persons, of people, but uh, it, in a company, uh, it introduces ideas, persons from outside, and it will also spill then after this innovation process, it will spill out some new ideas, new processes. Uh, so it's an incoming and an outgoing flow of information, of know-how, of uh, maybe uh, intellectual property rights which can be licensed. So, but as I have uh, mentioned, this innovation process the development of new products and on is an, in an open network needs the combination of ideas and humans. Well, the exchange between of ideas between humans. And in order to do this, well, one has to create a network. Well, or to create networks. And uh, at the very beginning of this idea of open innovation, it was more or less that Single persons, but a number of single of persons created uh, in, in kind of external network for a company mm -hmm. and uh, providing to the company different or these ideas from outside. Yeah? And the company created something. Yeah? Now that in the in the let's was maybe in the last, last ten years. This has changed. Huh? It's not uh, a, a big number or a number of, of external persons working in a free relationship with the company. It's already networks yeah, which are supposed to work with the company and transfer the knowledge of that network, but discuss the knowledge of the network. Transfer is not a good word because it looks so one-dimensional. Huh? Discuss the knowledge and uh, come the a mutual uh, problem solving process with a company which brings the process of the product on the market. Huh? So to create a network seems to be a must nowadays. A must in order to uh, there are two reasons behind it. Huh? In order to perform that innovation in a short period of time, as short as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, short period of time always means uh, low input of money, low input of budget, yeah? so uh, save time and money. Time to market yeah? and save investment costs because uh, the invest this investment money is not easily available. So, how can we imagine how that works, the start of an open innovation? It's very often simply an outsourcing deal, yeah? With, where a company gives a contract yeah? uh, to, in order to, to, to some external organizations, in order to uh, avoid that they build over capacities yeah? uh, in, the, in the company, one reason is to cut the costs yeah, and uh, grow through additional assets yeah, and to reduce the risk in this innovation process or development process. Yeah. But it's not everywhere understood. There are still, I would say, more than enough companies who do not want to speak with people outside of their closed environment. Uh, they have no contact in terms of innovation with external persons. Uh, there are enough, I can tell you, at the moment one doesn't. Uh, for example, very much in 
in the medical instrumentation business, no? the companies are so scared that they would lose know-how, uh, that somebody from outside would take their know-how, their very valuable, and bring it to another company, whatever. Yeah? So they are very, uh, very inserted into their environment and do not want and cannot speak with uh, about that topics with people from outside. Yeah? So still there are many, many companies uh, doing their business in this way. But uh, there are some pioneering industries, software industry, yeah? electronics, telecom industry, uh, surprisingly order the pharmaceutical industry, uh, less surprising the biotech industry. Yeah? And of course, I have shown you the uh, mentioned the example of the sports goods. Yeah? So all new sport equipment, uh, which is now uh, uh, every day's activity, yeah? uh, comes from from an open innovation process. It's not driven by a company producing sporting goods. It's driven by possible customers who want to do that. Yeah? Uh, some of these industries are much more convinced of that process. They understand it uh, and, and they really uh, push this process, especially the software and electronic industry, yeah, is actively developing uh, this open innovation process. Of course, because they see that on one side they can capture people with uh, excellent ideas, yeah, uh, with new ideas, yeah, new blood into their into their uh, development scene, and to get this for lower costs or maybe even, even free. Yeah? So a few examples: SAP and Microsoft. They have decentralized their research labs yeah, towards university campuses. Hmm? In order to get more. Uh, out of the ideas, get more from the ideas created at universities. Yeah? Yeah? So get the innovation from outside, yeah? the ideas from outside, and then in the first step, drive it to a, a primary innovation step together with the ideas, or with the people who created the ideas. Ever, for example, and you all know it better than I do, yeah? how uh, well accepted this brand is. Huh? There is a, a, like a, a religion around this community of the Apple users. Huh? And they all opened their technology. Huh? And uh, purposely I've written here to its addicted high-tech users. Huh? Uh, so there is a, a strong communication. In the electronic industry, Philips has an open innovation park. Xerox in Palo Alto has an open research center. Yeah. Siemens, IBM, yeah. and the, the example of IBM uh, we will discuss in detail. So all of the electronic suppliers are driven by open innovation processes yeah, on a very strategic level. So they really s s look for that. Yeah, they, uh, it doesn't only happen to them, they actively create this process for the benefit of their companies. Yeah? You see named here. Yeah? And although companies where you would not believe it, yeah? pharmaceutical companies, yeah? uh, biotechnology, okay, there I understand it easily. Yeah? Uh, Bayer is a creative center. Yeah? It's not only then focusing on chemistry. So there are many parallel businesses which are open. Uh, Lilly, a pharmaceutical company in the United States, Pfizer, yeah. So they really work with this tool. Yeah. What are the reasons to do it? Yeah. To change the innovation process. Yeah. Of course, the innovation process always happened, but uh, there are always changes. Also, the, the rate of of non-successful innovations produced is in the field of consumer goods between 35 and 60 percent, and in the field of industrial commodities 
it's less, but still uh, around 30%. Yeah? So this high risk to invest a lot of money without being so successful costs then a change in the strategy yeah, of the corporation, of the companies in the 1990s. Yeah? And already in the mid of 1990, yeah, you see around 50% of all innovative ideas came from outside the companies. Uh, because in a closed environment, uh, you are somehow dry, you get dried, the, the ideas, all ideas are discussed, uh, and you need blood and ideas from outside. Uh. So, these innovative corporations, of course, then finally uh, come to a cost reduction. And that is one of the reasons why they are looking for it. Yeah? Either have an increased benefit, financial benefit, because of new products, uh, and uh, a, re a reduction of risk. Yeah? And, of course, a reduced uh, time of the innovation cycle, which is then finally also a cost reduction. So, what is the source of innovation? You all know this very well-known formula. Of course, uh, one source are innovative ideas. Uh, you are here having a number of innovative ideas. Uh, some of them might become successful. Some of them are very crazy. But nevertheless, they have to be discussed. And uh, it is possible to transfer uh, this into into and successful outcome, whatever the outcome is. Yeah? So we need some ideas. Yeah? Uh, we need the demand to, to ride on the water yeah? uh, as fast as possible as a driving force. Yeah? Then, of course, we need something which we usually do not have, yeah? and somebody else has, capital or resources. Mm -hmm. That is a need for the innovation, but it does not bring an innovative idea per se. And we need networks and reputation. Uh, I will uh, introduce you a company in, in Austria yeah, which handled this since 40 years, it's 50 years now. Yeah. Then I will go a little bit into that network and reputation stuff. So, what do we have to do in order to create that process? We have to bring together the right persons. Huh? So we have a number of people with different skills, different education, different possibilities, uh, uh, and they fit into such a process which we, which we want to discuss yeah, in different fields, of course. Huh? I would not feel fit into the law field of the young lady here, yeah? and she might not be interested in my uh, physical chemistry. So we all of us have specific fields where we are interested in. Yeah? So on one side we have to fulfill the need of the organization yeah? with these people, yeah? either in managing aspects, in producing aspects, yeah? whatever. Yeah? This is one need which has to be fulfilled by the people who are in that network. Huh? Other people or other needs are the need of resources. Huh? In terms of money, huh? in terms of <coughs> ideas, in terms of products and some uh, processes, how to handle that, how to do this. Huh? And of course, also and we have different tasks to be fulfilled, and for this, all these, uh, all these uh, needs have to be understood, have to be accepted, and have to be then uh, dealt with from that group of people in order to be able to finally create an inno innovation process. Huh? What are the complications? It sounds so easily. Yeah? What are the complications? At the moment, we have very strong trend of increasing costs in research and development. 
Uh, this is a very German portion of the region, yeah? R and D, sorry. Yeah? So with the increased cost, we have of course an increased uh, demand on the budget, an increased uh, investment risk, and in which uh, the people who have the money in their purse they want to avoid that risk. Yeah? Then a very severe uh, complication is the short-term planning horizon. Huh? In 1960, 70, 80, huh? the companies had a planning horizon of 10 years, many even much longer planning horizons. Huh? In some uh, economies you had a five-year planning horizon. Yeah? Uh, and nowadays this is shortened very much. Yeah? Uh, it's called an on-site uh, development process, an on-site management process. You do only what you have in your immediate visibility because the product cycles are so short. Yeah? And you can see that very easily. Yeah? Uh, think about, uh, you are too young for that, but uh, a telephone uh, was more or less the same since 1930 when they did not have to connect the cable somewhere in a big connecting line. Yeah? Uh, then in 1930 you could dial a number yeah? with a rotating wheel and uh, got your connection. Of course, minor improvements were made, but nothing changed until the 70s. So it was more or less uh, at least 30 years uh, where no changes on the telephone. Yeah? There was no need and no ideas. Yeah? But then uh, the, the quality of the phone uh, changes every year now. Huh? Uh, and almost nobody has a, a fastness anschluss. What is that? Uh, landline. Hmm? Landline. Uh, the landline now. Yeah? Everybody has a mobile and uh, I don't have a landline. Okay. So then we have this demand or this complication is the increasing centralization. <coughs> Of the market. Uh, the big ones uh, digest the small ones uh, and everybody, everything is, is, is now uh, tries to centralize from the point of view order to reduce costs. Uh, then we have of course this financial crisis which is in everybody's uh, mind at the moment uh, and from this <coughs> we have less money for public funding. Huh? We have certainly, you experience it in, in the moment very, very strong. Yeah? We experience it yeah? and everywhere there is no public money available. Hmm? Uh, the numbers down here shows the percentage of the budget which can be uh, which is free to be focused on different topics. Yeah? In the 60s, the communities, the states, the governments had around 40% of the budget money free to allocate it where it was needed. Hmm? This reduces rapidly. In the 80s, it was only 80% of that, of that uh, taxpayers' money, whatever it comes. And in 2010, in Europe, it's only 5% of the money free to allocate it somewhere. And in the United States, we have <coughs> a negative side of for that. So the United States are completely, uh, completely fixed in the environment of their budget, in the borders of their budget. And they almost have no money to dispose or to say, yes, we transfer it from that topic to another topic. There is no free money left. And the same happens with companies. So, this guy, Mr. Schumpeter, is a very well known theoretician in whatever business uh, activities. And he has. Uh, created or he has uh, expressed that process very nicely in a German expression but 
uh, I tried to say it in English also. No? So he said that the organic development of the industry of the industry is a mutation process, is an evolution evolution process. And this evolution process permanently changes the established structures yeah, and creates new ones. This process happens. It's an organic development. And development not driven by the entrepreneurs, not driven by the companies or the society. It's something which happens because of the interaction of many bills in the society. And this process to the understanding of the theoretician on the business theory cannot be interrupted, it cannot be stopped. And those companies who are able to step into that evolution process and to change themselves, to evolve permanently, these are the companies which are successful. And the other ones who are not able to do so, they will run into problems and will uh, be, go bankrupt, whatever. Yeah? Uh, no, I can give you one, immediately one example for that. I do not know if Kodak is still something, does mean something to you. Yeah? Uh, what is Kodak for you? Kodak films. No, but nobody needs a film anymore. Yeah, but there's still one of these days to produce also film reels for actual yeah, movies. Yeah, but in, let's say when at the time when you when you uh, was uh, not born yet, yeah, then one said uh, if you were standing in front of the Grand Canyon or on on the Himalaya or whatever, yeah, on uh, on a very beautiful spot, this is a Kodak point, because all tourists came there, everybody took a couple of pictures, yeah, and millions and millions of people took billions of billions of pictures, and it was a Kodak point. And in a time frame of less than 10 years, yeah, this business, including all the business afterwards, completely changed. Yeah, it disappeared. Yeah. Yes, they need for documentation some pictures. Yeah. You need something for the movie industry. Yeah. But the main business disappears. The same with the cameras and all. So the German optic industry is not existent anymore. Yeah. Because, of course, they were, they were satisfied. They were great. We produce the best optics. No question. Our cameras are perfect. But nobody needs it. Huh? We don't need it anymore. Huh? So they disappeared. Huh? The German uh, photovoltaic industry is just in the in the process to disappear. Huh? It's everything is they they were strong in the very beginning, huh? and now the main parts are produced in China and in Far East, and only the electronics which drives the system or handles the system still uh, produced and invented in Germany. So we have a permanent evolutionary process in the life of a company. And this is a cycle, you know it, I guess, yeah, a product life cycle. So we at the universities and research centers, we are somewhere here, yeah, down in the basement, and the uh, position here is always connected with money. So no money, low money. No income, yeah. don't go there. Yeah. Then they launch the, the, the product, yeah. and this product is introduced, it grows, yeah. the production grows, the market grows, yeah. and the company comes to product number one, and several production cycles or innovation cycles, and finally they have a mature system. I'm looking for an example. A fax machine, yeah, for example. Yeah. It was introduced in the <coughs> 1970s, something. Yeah. It was developed, it was launched, 
Yeah? There came several generations of fax machines, and now nobody needs a fax machine anymore. Yeah? There are some offices, yes. Who buys a new fax machine? You don't need it anymore. So, now well, let's analyze this uh, innovation cycle and this uh, lifetime cycle for the products. Uh, let's say we have we start here at the very beginning. Yeah? Uh, you have an <coughs> idea yeah? about a new organization of law companies, about a new uh, process in, in uh, let's say, high-speed electronics, yeah? uh, whatever. And uh, you have a good idea, and this idea uh, develops. I believe I have to go to the next one. Yeah. So, these ideas come from inventors, from pioneers, from thinkers. Yeah? Uh, Basler in German. Huh? People who do it in their, in their garage. Yeah? Who produce something in their garage. Okay? They are not necessarily entrepreneurs. Huh? Usually they are not, no? because we all scientists, engineers, whatever, are too stupid to earn money. No? But in combination with an entrepreneur, yeah. we come into the first part of the life of a product. No? We enter this year, yeah? the development and ready to launch uh, period of the product. Hmm? And then uh, we, if the product is established, the product and the company will have many innovation cycles. It is improves the product, yeah? a new one is created, and on and on. Yeah? And it will come finally into a mature state. In that process of the development of the product in the company, yeah? uh, managers are needed. No people who create something new. No, they have to build up a structure, they have to build up an organization, they have to make decisions, yeah? and some experts are needed, but usually not experts who have new ideas, but to produce it cheaper, yeah? to make it easier running, whatever. Yeah? So we have many, many production cycles, innovation cycles, hopefully, yeah? and nevertheless, for the experience, the history shows that Finally, the company comes into an equilibrium state. Yeah? All the money in the company, the company has a, has a, a high value. The shareholder value is, is, is high. Yeah? The, the bonds are strong. Yeah? But uh, there is no money disposable in the company because the research guy needs something, yeah? the developers need, yeah? the, product, the production has costs, yeah? the management needs something, the shareholders want, want uh, their income, and there is no money uh, free to be disposed. Hmm? And uh, that is then the uh, number of these reasons are uh, the reason why we have a destruction process of the companies. Huh? If you are not able, the company is not able to uh, stay with always new with innovations in that cycle, they will approach this destructive situation. Huh? And you see it with many companies. Huh? Uh, what is, uh, you had a year a big, uh, big uh, industry for, for, uh, for cars for the, the railway, no? Mm -hmm. In Maribor. Yeah. Hmm? It's gone. Mm -hmm. huh? What else? Huh? Everything else. Everything else. Yeah, the, the textile industry is gone. Not only it's not it's not only a question of the of the labor costs. Absolutely not, because there are high value <coughs> textile companies in Italy. There are some in in Slovenia, huh? but the, most of the business is gone. Huh? And we come in a situation uh, where there is a chaos in the company, a destruction. Huh? Kodak does not exist anymore in his uh, value, in the size, in the number of products. It's a small company, seems to be big, yeah? but if compared to their value and their size uh, 30 years ago, it's a small leftover company. And here in that situation, yeah? 
And these people are again needed, which are usually, let's say, the, uh, the one here down there. That is, these are the developers. They bring always too late the product and they only cost money and they are for nothing. But then, uh, in a sudden, they need new ideas. They need uh, lateral thinkers, huh? people who come from outside and have other ideas. They need researchers, they need artists, whatever. Huh? Uh, they need open-minded experts. And to give you an example how we are accepted in, in Austria, the artists and the researchers are in the same financial group. So we are dealing with, uh, with the ones playing on the street, whatever. Uh, it's fine, I like them. But we are we are like artists. Okay, so these are needed with their ideas, and then uh, the company is more or less uh, completely broken up. Hmm? It needs a reorganization, huh? and for that reorganization, that is very much similar to a start-up situation. Uh, business angels are needed. Venture capital is needed. Yeah. Uh, business incubators and mentors are needed. And those uh, people have to reorganize the company, have to use these pioneers uh, to develop new products, uh, to come up with new ideas. And in that way, that is the cycle, the natural cycle of an organization. But it's not only a company, it's also a social organization. Think about uh, parties, whatever. Yeah? Uh, they, everything behaves very similar to that scheme. Yeah. So a new cycle starts, yeah? and this cycle can then start with open innovation. If you do not create this tool in the lifetime of the company, yeah? you can see it also a little bit different. That what kind of persons are needed. Yeah? Uh, here it's an entrepreneur action at the beginning. Yeah? It's somebody who says, yes, I want to do that. Yeah? I have the vision that I can create a company, I can create a lot of money. Yeah? And uh, that is the, uh, in many companies are well known for that. Yeah? They have very often one person which is the center of the company, yeah, like an old. Uh, you know, okay. Then you need strategic management. Hmm? You need to conserve what you have, and you have to innovate again. If you do not innovate permanently, you will fall into that crisis and will come to the confusion. And then charismatic leadership is needed. Yeah? Charismatic leadership can also be this entrepreneur. Yeah? Charismatic persons are needed, which would not be accepted uh, in this period of the growth of the company. Because there, uh, organizers are, managers are needed, not charismatic persons. Yeah? And then you can build a creative network. And then open innovation will come in in any case, yeah? uh, because you need it. Uh, you need something from outside, huh? and the cycle starts again. And so you have this open innovation, and here you have intermediates in between, yeah? which uh, may be able, by their uh, personality, even to bring a company to the process of permanent in innovation. And we'll see how necessary this is. Yeah? So, I have to speed up a little bit, I'm sorry. Uh, how long do you want to hear uh, what I have to present? Let's go for a beer. Uh, uh, okay. How to improve, what are the challenges yeah, for companies, for R&D organizations, for regions, for social networks? It's not a company, but it's easier to speak about a company than a social network. Yeah? The challenge is to improve the organization's potential <coughs> to survive in tough times. And how can this be done? Yeah. One has to create 
resilient networks. These are networks who have the strength to resist a force coming from outside. Yeah? So these networks can overcome crises yeah? by using social resources, personal resources, people who want to invest their time, their brains, their activity, yeah? and to use this crisis and the network of these people as an initiator for, for a development. Yeah? I have also written in German, yeah? Uh, if they are made people. Yeah? So we have to make decisions in the lifetime of such an organization in the region. Hmm? What can we do as usually, as we had done yesterday and the day before yesterday? What is worth to do it also tomorrow and the day after tomorrow? And what can we do what we did not do until now? What have we do tomorrow different from yesterday in order to uh, achieve what we want? Hmm? So these networks give the chance to new fields, uh, to innovative groups uh, that they can establish themselves. Uh, and of course, uh, focus the, the, uh, the situation that they will also become uh, rigid uh, and not able to move anymore. Uh. So it, it is this process, a renewing process for the already existing established fields. Uh. So companies, corporations are successful for a long time if they can achieve both in a complex environment. Uh. And this is called resilient. have seen it. So this is again the same picture that I've seen before, but just should, should, should express that permanently the whatever it is has to go through innovation cycles. It can be a political party. There you see it also. Uh, you have the major in, in the town of Maribor, I don't know him, we have a major in the town of Graz who is successful for three, four, five years. And finally, he's at the end of his uh, ability to innovate his uh, party, his uh, organization, and he will come into a crisis. You know? And so the need is to have a sustainable uh, process of innovation. And now we come to the closed and open networks. You know? and very close in connection with closed and open innovation. Closed network, you see here. This is a, a many groups of people who work together nicely, and maybe in between are a few ones who are uh, individuals who do not want to cooperate and work together. No? And then you have these structural whole networks, yeah, where sometimes one person uh, penetrates in the structure of another network and a small exchange of ideas and whatever can happen. Yeah? And so you have different networks, this forward network where more people are interacting but they all are interacting uh, with more or less one central group and they are interacted in a day by day uh, situation. It is a non-organized interaction process. And what finally is needed, uh, then we come again to this life cycle of the product. Uh, we need well-organized networks where each network uh, inter overlaps with another one, uh, showing the exchange, but in a somehow organized and driven way. Uh, and we have again here the people who have to contribute. Uh, it's not the case that at the very beginning of the company it's the pioneers and then let's forget the pioneers. Uh, no, you need the pioneers all over the uh, lifetime. Uh, and if you do not, uh, do not give them enough room, uh, your company will more uh, earlier or later come to that 
uh, mature maturity and finally in the cows because the market <coughs> doesn't need the, uh, what the company can give you. Huh? We have seen that. Huh? Make a break, huh? no. it's up to you. No? <coughs> no biological breaks needed? Yeah, so no smoker? You need one. You need one. Okay. Cigarette? Well. Sorry, I didn't interrupt me if, if it's not understandable or something. Continue, yeah, you know that, what an open innovation means. Yeah. Uh, and what is needed and what is looked for is an amplification effect. It's not just an additional uh, contribution, it's really an amplification effect of that open innovation. And that is based on the extension of ideas and problem solving strategies. So the Target is to integrate sources uh, from outside uh, to get better access to the customer, have better uh, ideas, problem solving capacities. And in contrast, the closed innovation process, which is still existing, your question, uh, uh, relies on the input, the ideas usually of the of a very limited group of persons yeah? engineers usually located in an r d department yeah? and even if the company tries to integrate now the sales persons and whatever yeah? uh, usually the engineers say ah, the bullshit they tell you is for nothing and the uh, the sales person said we don't understand what the engineers are talking about and we don't we don't uh, see what we are doing there because that's super nothing. Yeah? And that is very often, uh, very often the case. Yeah? So, what can we do? How can we establish such an open innovation network yeah? providing this? What uh, tools do we have? What, which tools can we turn? Yeah? What kind of activities are needed? Yeah? Can such an activity be planned? We will see. With a number of examples that they can't be organized, they can't be planned. Uh, but a little bit, uh, we do. We have to have to, to understand a little bit about these uh, relationships, yeah? beneficial relationships. And beneficial has many meanings. You see, there are at least four words in English. Yeah? It's beneficial. It's profitable. It's fruitful. It's utile. Yeah? It's pleasant. Whatever. Yeah? So and we, it is designed, it is uh, separated between two kind of relationships. A value-creating relationship, 
uh, the target is money and a precious valuable relationship the target is meaning yeah? so I can uh, cope with that person because of the meaning their uh, personality yeah? and it's not a question of the money but both are important aspects and if you see here yeah, we have here the shared meanings and the value creation of such a network. Yeah? So that network can consist of an accidentally uh, meetings. Because we come together now, yeah? uh, we build for two hours a network, yeah? and then uh, it, uh, we have no shared meanings. I do not know yours, you don't mind, no minds, and we also will not create money. So, but it's a um, short term relationship. I think about many of these relationships. Huh? And then, but we can, could develop this with a few, may not be with everybody, with a few of us, we can uh, come up, okay, that uh, was an incentive, let's create uh, something new and we earn a lot of money. We make a deal. Huh? We make a deal and we create value. On the other side, huh, some of the people meeting here huh, have common interests. Huh? Uh, in sports, in, in other private activities. So they can create a relationship based on means. It can be a long term relationship. But you can combine this, you can come to a strategic relationship where both parts are needed the value creation part and the meaning part. And then you will have a kind of long-term strategic relationship. Here you see it in a little bit another uh, presentation, but it is the same. Yeah? Uh, the target is to create this resilient relationship or resilient network. Yeah? Not just coming together, not being a network of families or tribes, yeah? but having a relationship based on meanings and on uh, value creation. So, how can we control that? This is a number of handles, but you can read it on your own. Uh, it's shown in the next picture. So, we have, of course, a driving force. One is money. One force is know-how. Yeah? Uh, provide know-how to people to keep them in the, in the network. Yeah? Uh, training programs, conferences. People are allowed to go to conferences, yeah? workshops. Yeah? Reputation. Huh? I gain some reputation because I give a lecture here. Might be wrong, and you say that this stupid guy was speaking about bullshit, so I will not gain reputation. Huh? But you can get awards. Uh, you can become a member of the advisory board. And of course, relationships, events, chats at the evening, uh, recreation activities. So these are the screws you can turn to create a network. So that was intended for the break. So then we have already heard a lot about this open innovation. So it needs the free discussion space and exchange of ideas. Uh, it's already accepted by even conservative manufacturers. Companies who realize that, that is needed, look for partner, startups, universities, research organizations, but also <coughs> their customer. Huh? The customer can be a, a, a very important, or is a very important source of information and ideas. Huh? Philips opened its research center in the Netherlands huh? <coughs> for external researchers. It's a high tech campus, and this shall need. Yeah, uh, innovation boost. That is uh, the idea behind. Yeah? So one topic is ubiquitous computing. How, mm -hmm. well, however you want to see that it is positive or not, but it's one of the topics. So such corporations must not stay forever. Can be temporary. Yeah? 
this Mr. Chesper, the new imperative for creating and profiting from technology. No? He speaks about the interaction between companies, R&D, personnel, no? uh, that this does not create innovation on a closed ground. No? And that it is necessary to open that. It's based on the generous utilization of existing knowledge. But that must not be free of charge. But I will show you one of these theories to show uh, that it's very often free of charge because the R&D people are not able to to create money out of that process. They are too stupid for that, including my person. No? So, create new knowledge, we said this very often. And there are many theories and many people you are working on that. I named some, and it's always the same topic uh, with different names. So, this man uh, answered some question, or raised some question. Why? is a new innovation model needed. Uh, because the ideas are both sides generated, outside and inside. Uh, the intellectual property rights are valuable. Even if they are not used by a company, you can, you can deal with these IPRs. Yeah? Uh, I will show this in an example. Yeah? The open innovation is the use of inflows and outflows. And you can, of course, also create money with the outflows. Yeah? The final location of the innovation is an organization, a social organization, a company. Yeah? Because finally you have to have some organization who, who uses, which utilizes that what was innovate, innovated. Yeah? And the main consequence, it is management needed for the knowledge flow and the utilization of the knowledge. It's not only an organization management of the product of the company, you have also to manage the IPRs. So this is a, an example uh, from internal ideas, external technologies, flowing into that channel of a funnel of innovation. And finally, uh, some organization products come out. Yeah? And beside that, to come to that target, you need an insourcing of technology. You will also create in that process a lot of technologies which are not needed for your product. Yeah? And you can license these technologies and you can create spin-offs. Uh, yeah, we discussed that more or less. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead. Yeah. So, what can be inno innovated? Of course, new products. You can have usability improvements of the products. You can have functional improvements of an organization. Or you can have only a technique innovation. No? So these are different ways how to innovate. No? And this is something which I want to show you uh, uh, because of a few sentences. Yeah? They are more, he speaks about uh, dissociation innovation you know, or dispersed innovation. No? Uh, but more or less it's always uh, the same topic behind uh, independent on the name, yeah? but uh, the role of the innovator yeah, can be used to categorize, the, to define the location of the innovation, yeah? but the innovator doesn't have to be the manufacturer, yeah? that is not necessary. Yeah? Uh, and the necessary precondition from the companies who use that process of open innovation is 
it must be difficult for the innovators to adopt new functional relationships to their innovation. <coughs> Usually it's not a manufacturer who innovates. Yeah? And therefore, and the innovator doesn't have a company to manufacture. Yeah? Inventors cannot become manufacturers, otherwise there would be a competition for the manufacturer. And the ones who have the money, the innovators usually don't have the money. The ones who have the money see the innovators as a competitor. Yeah? And uh, luckily, they, the innovators don't have the money. Yeah? If a role switching is easy, then everybody could create an income, a profit out of the innovation. But unfortunately, if you innovate something, you might not have the money to turn it into a profit. Somebody else will do it. Innovators must have a poor ability to capture rent by licensing. So the innovators are not even not able to license their innovation because they don't have the, the legal background, they don't have the connection with the companies who could need it. So a new business was established. This uh, uh, people dealing with innovation 20 years ago, that were not existed. So if licensing is easy, innovators can capture returns that are, in, and this, it would be independent on their own function. So everybody could could get a return, could create some income, yeah, if he could uh, easily <coughs> license what he has invented. Now I will show you an example of a huge company, IBM. Hmm? IBM was successful and established yeah? <coughs> uh, in the fast growing IT market. No question, everybody knows it. Yeah? And it has really a long history of research and development. Well, many innovations coming from IBM. But nevertheless, it was one of the first enterprises to see the competition, yeah? uh, which made a lot of problems for IBM. Yeah? The competition in a highly dynamic industrial environment. Yeah? Warum? Why? The IT market became more and more complex. Yeah? And new players came in. Yeah? Cisco and HP, yeah? Microsoft, RSL, SAP. Yeah? And they become strong competitors for IBM. Yeah? They all come from, let's say, the innovative sector of the industry communication and information technology. Yeah. And then an additional uh, threat was the merging of traditional industries. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the demand of the medicine for uh, communication technology, high value electronics was almost zero. Nowadays, uh, it's completely different. Yeah. Uh, Information technology and in, in communication technology is a major uh, cost factor in the medical industry, a uh, medical business. No? Uh, the bi biological business, no? high tech biology, needs a lot of uh, information uh, measurement technology behind, and the merging of those no? uh, were a threat for the already existing big. Companies. Yeah. So, but this new situation also gave chances to new business. Yeah. The e business is a completely new business. Yeah. Yeah. But this uh, modification, this, let's say, this turbulences in the market, of course, uh, also increased the degree of uncertainty in the market. So it is essential for large enterprises that they do not only invest in research and development, but they have to open up this innovation process yeah? and use this as a strategic activity. Yeah? And now see how 
IBM did this. Yeah? So they understood that they need changes, they need to go to markets, to uh, innovations outside their core business. Yeah? And they created a strategy which they call EBO, Emerging Business Opportunities. Yeah? And uh, they live this, that is a part of the strategy of the company. So they integrate business partners very early. Yeah? They integrate customers, yeah? market research, development analysts into their innovation process. And this is a concept which was taken over by many other uh, or <coughs> extended in <coughs> extended extended in sorry extended in in IBM is a first of a kind project, a demand innovation service, industry, industry solution labs, on the on. Yeah? And they really activated lead customers to test these new technologies. And they built here in Europe a big lab with 300 people only to create the relationship with the academics and East industrial partners in Europe. Yeah, to improve the current technology, technological know-how, yeah, to follow technological development in Europe. Yeah. Four or five IBM Nobel Prize winners come from that level. <coughs> R&D is most important for the success of IBM. They have investments of around 5 billion per year, that's 5 to 6 percent of the revenue since 1996. They play a constant leading role in US and worldwide number of patents. And they create 10 billion in licensing, so they create twice as much uh, from license agreements than they spent for the investment in the R&D process. Huh? Yeah, okay, you can read that. So, and now let's go to an example which I uh, really experienced. Hmm? Because IBM is so big and so far away, so uh, you can take from the literature hundreds of these examples. Yeah? Uh, the negative, uh, negative ones I've uh, discussed with you, uh, there are enough. Yeah? Or the, but Kodak is one of the best. Yeah? Because uh, you won't find a world leader company which falls on their ass as rapidly as, as Kodak did. Yeah? So, there is a big company in Graz yeah? with the name Anton Parr. Uh, which lifts this open innovation process since 60 years, or 50 years. Yeah? Uh, they started, <coughs> you can read that, yeah? they started, I'll tell you the story, yeah? they started as a little, as a small machining company. Uh, in the Second World War, they were very well, well known for precise machining. And after that, of course, uh, there was a, a, a period of time where they were not accepted uh, because they worked in the, uh, for, the, for the Third Reich. Yeah? Okay, nevertheless, yeah, uh, they still were well known for their precise machine. And they were close to the university. Yeah? Uh, and one guy from the university asked, the owner, could you please produce for me a collimation system, an objective, uh, the, the camera uh, as an objective, yeah, yeah. and uh, if you, if the light you use is an X-ray beam, uh, uh, X-ray is a Röntgen uh, beam. Then you don't need cross lenses, 
but you need some kind of a, uh, a metal equipment which does the same as the gas lenses for the visible light. Uh, uh, you need something to, to, to adjust the beam uh, to, to, the, to the size how it should be. Yeah, it's the same as you do it with an optics which you can see. Yeah? And what do you do with such a method? It's a completely crazy, crazy method, but I can somehow explain to you uh, what's the nice. Usually we would see here uh, on the way to the beach uh, a girl with a bikini, but now we drive around in uh, south of Udine, yeah? and there are many wine guys, you know that. Yeah? Here is the wine growing. Yeah? Good. And now we pass by here with our car. And if we are just in that position, we easily can see that church. Hmm? I have to make some more of this. Yeah? If we are here, we don't see the church because of the wine. And there are certainly other angles where we can see the church, but only for a very short period of time. And if you now, let's say there is a microscope experiment which you can make on, on the highway or wherever, yeah, you can experience that it's not a problem. Yeah? If that here is not a church, a car or a person, but it's a molecule yeah? uh, which you want to investigate. Yeah? Then such a molecule has a size of, let's say, ten angstrom to thousand angstrom. That is one nanometer to one hundred or more nanometers to N. So it's pretty small. No? And to see such a small molecule, no? you, uh, you have to reduce the size of the light which you use to investigate that molecule. So the light has to have the same size, or the same frequency, no? or the same wavelength as the size of the molecule. Otherwise, you would not see Think about, we have a route from here to, to the main building of the university. Yeah? If my, and I'm the investigator, yeah? if my size scale is that of an elephant, yeah? I would never be able to go through that, to, through the trees, because the, the space is too narrow. So I would never see the, the main building of the university, I would never approach it, because I'm too big. Yeah? If I am a human, I can go through that wood. If I am a small ant, I can easily go through the wood, through the wood. But in all my lifetime, I would only see two or three of the trees. And I would never realize that there is a big wood. So the size of the, of the tool you use for the investigation has to have the same size, has to be the same as the material you want to investigate. And so, if you want to investigate molecules and get an idea about the structure and whatever, yeah, then the size of the, the wavelengths of the, of the light you use for the investigation has to be more or less in the same, in the same size. So, and this uh, X-ray has a, a wavelength of 3 whatever you use to 10 extra, yeah? depending on the source you use. So that is the right, but you cannot, you cannot uh, organize the beam with, with an, an, an optical lenses. Yeah? You have to organize it with a, some kind of a lenses coming from, from prepared from metal. Yeah? Okay, and that was the beginning that this machining company produced scientific instruments. And then the story becomes more crazy because to uh, calculate 
these values here, which you get out, uh, the size of the molecule, the density, uh, whatever electron density, distribution, things like that. Yeah? In order to calculate, to be able to calculate, you have to know the difference in the density of the solvent. If we speak about a, an, an enzyme, it's water or a buffer. Yeah? The solvent and the solution, in order to be able to evaluate the data. So. Uh, then there was a problem, it was not possible to measure the density of liquids precisely enough. And the guy who has developed uh, this method, or was one of the developers of the method, had two youngsters in your age. Yeah? One was an electronic doctor, engineer. In that time, you would say it was an electrician. It was not really an electronic business. Yeah? And and uh, a people who was very fixed in construction, and he told to these both uh, young persons, they just have finished their studies. Uh, I need an instrument <coughs> which is able to measure the density of fluids uh, very precisely. Okay, they came up with a solution, and this is the basis of a company which has now, you see it here, I don't know, one. 1,500 employees, and they are the number one in the control of, of beverages. So they are the number one worldwide in the control of the production of beer. They have 70% of the world market of this beer uh, production process. And that is based on that idea and the demand to measure the density of a fluid, very precisely. How to dissolve it if you are interested? It's pretty simple. They created a U shaped tube. And if one of you is a musician, then you know that you have such a U shaped instrument to create a, a well defined uh, frequency. Huh? And uh, if you put a chewing gum on that U shaped instrument and you want to create that that frequency again is not possible. You have changed the mass of that system and therefore it will, it will oscillate in a different frequency. No? It will give you a different tone. No? And uh, the same here, if you fill the new tube with fluid uh, and you let it oscillate, then it will oscillate if your electronics is properly in its eigen uh, Schwingung. No? In the, in, and the frequency where it needs the minimum of energy. And if you can determine that frequency, then you know something about the mass inside the tube, and in that way you can measure the density of fluids. Very, very precise. Much more precise, precise enough for all the crazy scientists like me. No? Uh, you had a you had an chemical engineer? Sorry, no? One in that business? No one who, who doesn't want to earn money here. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> but with that, with that yeah, but everybody knows what the DNA molecule is. Yeah? Uh, with that instrument, you can measure, for example, yeah, if you you know the, the picture of that bubble helix DNA, yeah, and if you increase the temperature yeah, of the solution of that DNA, then it defaults in two single strands. And then it's, if you decrease the temperature, it again produces this nice double helix. No? It's a very stable molecule. And if you uh, do that in such a U-shaped densitometer, then you see that at a certain, if the temperature keeps constant, then you rise the temperature, the density increases. No? And if you keep the temperature constant, the density is the same. And if you go down with the temperature again, the density uh, goes down. Uh, so you can really uh, monitor such a process with such a density meter. But that's not the important <coughs> application. So you would not drink a liter of beer, a liter of milk, whatever, without, uh, without such an instrument nowadays. Each liter of beer has seen such an instrument. Why? Because what, do, what does the brewer do? The brewer uh, brews the 
the, the basic part, yeah? so uh, it cooks the, the ingredients of the beer, yeah? takes away the, the dispersed stuff like the skin of, the, of um, whatever, yeah? and then it has a, a thick brew yeah? which with a, with a uh, high concentration of tasting substances and then it dilutes it with water. That's what the beer brewer is doing. And the beer brewer promises you on the bottle that there is 5.4% alcohol plus a certain amount of, of warts of tasty substances inside. Of course, he doesn't want to give you more than he promises on the bottle. Yeah? And how can you measure it? Yeah? The beer runs through such an instrument. Of course, then it's not a tiny hole, it's such a, a, a tube. Yeah? Uh, and you, the, the, the brewing industry measures the concentration of the alcohol and these tasting substances. The same with all ingredients which have sugar inside. Yeah? You measure the sugar content or you measure the alcohol content with such a method. And the, the, the guy who goes to the farmer or drives his truck to the farmer and collects the milk from the farmers, yeah? uh, measures the density of the milk because the farmer, the, the important, the valuable material inside is the fat and the tasty substances, yeah? not the water. And the more tasty substances and fat the farmer delivers, the more he gets paid for the milk. So uh, in almost every everything we consume, we think such a density meter is needed. Yeah? So there is a story again. In the 50s, uh, my institute, but there I was in, in still uh, in, <laughs> in the cradle, yeah. uh, my institute developed X-ray scattering vessels. Yeah. And Bar was a small machining company. Hmm? And uh, there was a demand of these tensitometers. Hmm? And in the 60s, Bar started to produce scientific instruments. Yeah. In the 70s, there was a demand on instrumentation measured in viscosity of fluids and things like that. Yeah? Uh, and uh, they developed together with the university in Graz uh, instrumentation for that. Yeah? Then surface charge was something which was needed. Yeah? And they produced it. And in the 1980s, one of the main uh, inventors of this system here, this was the uh, constructor uh, uh, developed and uh, established a development center for scientific instruments and he licenses uh, his uh, developments to power mainly. Yeah, unfortunately I was only involved in a few of those. Yeah, if I would have developed the density meters I wouldn't speak here. Yeah. So that is a picture. You see, you can become rich with scientific instruments. Yeah? And now, this is the inventor <coughs> of this X ray scattering uh, method. And here you see an old instrument. Well, it's not the oldest one, but this is the, the picture of the oldest, the, 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 the oldest picture I could, found, I could find. Yeah? That is an old instrument, yeah? big, complicated instrument. Yeah? In, in the night time, you had to go there and, and change something yeah? because you could not switch off the X ray tube because it took hours to become the same, to get the same intensity again. It was really a pain in the ass. Yeah? Uh, but it worked. Nowadays, it looks like that. Yeah. So it is an open innovation process, and the owner of that company, yeah, uh, he had a sentence to say, uh, innovation is to know somebody who knows somebody, yeah. without knowing anything about open innovation, because this, this name was not created yet. So another example, this is one of the first uh, youth shaped tubes yeah, which we found in our labs. Yeah. Here is that U-shaped tube yeah, and that oscillates. So that's just how it looks like. Yeah. You can really create something. And this is a viscometer. Yeah. Uh, I didn't find an old picture, but this was a picture of the first series created by Anton Barr. And I said to that person with this sentence, 
or it. We will never be able to sell that instrument. Well, I developed it, but I said, we will never earn money and you will lose your money. No, 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 trust me. We will find the market and we can sell it. Now, it's still uh, the picture on the left side might be 15 years, 20 years old. Yeah? It's now still an instrument used for uh, to test liquids. Yeah? It looks a little bit different. Well, okay, go ahead. So, one more example if you have time, if it's enough, then we stop. So, uh, the demand to, to control a process in, in the production industry is, of course, high. Why? Because you want to run that process smooth, you want to reduce the resources, you want to reduce the energy input, and you want to, you want of course to reduce the the personal costs, you know, the labor costs. Because if you can do it automatically, you don't need a lab. Yeah? So it has positive and negative sides. Going back to the to the uh, example from the beer brewer, yeah? ten years ago, a medium-sized beer brewery like Union or or whatever, yeah, Lashko had a lab with around 15 persons. I do not know it about your breweries, I know it about the Austrian breweries. They have a lab with one person. And the 14 others have to find another job. So it's not needed anymore. Because they have a lot of online control instrumentation and the control instruments in the lab are much easier to handle so they don't need the labor anymore. So. Optical sensing. Yeah? Uh, I just want to speak about that part of sensing. Yeah? There are many methods to do it. Electric sensors, where you usually uh, use the change in, in uh, resistivity of something to measure. Yeah? For example, uh, if if I uh, if uh, you measure a pressure, yeah? you, uh, you somehow do it in an electric way, however. Yeah? Yeah? And, but there are many, uh, many uh, points where it is not so satisfying to do it. Yeah? Uh, therefore, uh, there is a big demand to measure a number of properties in an optical way. For example, you have here an institute which is worldwide known for to measure in an optical way uh, via a glass fiber cable. Good. They have a glass, long glass fiber cables and they introduce structures in the glass fiber cables where the cable is so thin that it changes, for example, its diameter or its length of this very thin part. Hmm? And as soon as that happens, <coughs> yeah, the uh, light which is which is inserted in the cable and comes back again yeah, is somehow changed because the refractive index of the piece of material changed. And so you can sense uh, over a distance of a few kilometers if somebody went over that cable on position number seven or whatever. Yeah? That is a, a well known group here in Maribor. And there are others, and we are working on the sensing of chemical, not physical parameters, but chemical parameters. Yeah? Uh, oxygen, CO2, CH, some other chemical parameters. Yeah? And do, we do this with a fluorescent uh, method. Yeah? I will explain it in a minute. Yeah? You see, the uh, activities in that since started 400 or 500, almost 450 years ago. Yeah? But uh, from, the, the, from the first uh, mentioning of that process uh, it uh, took 400 years to come up with a laboratory instrument huh? then uh, 20 years later highly sophisticated laboratory instruments were available huh? uh, expensive huge huh? uh, in the 90s there was the R&D target to create small and low priced sensors huh? the size can Hold it in your hand and throw it wherever you want. Yeah? In a, in a, in a uh, 
in, in, in the river, in the, in, in the, in the groundwater and so on. Yeah? Uh, and we also started to uh, develop these and we were one really of the first ones to come up with a good working oxygen sensor. Yeah? And in 2003 it was uh, so ripe and so well developed that we tried to uh, get a license agreement with one of the big, or with the big uh, producer of these kind of sensors. And it was not accepted. Why not? Because they had an electrochemical sensor it was called, called Clark Cell. Uh, there was no competition on the market, uh, no driving force. And they said, no, we don't need this. Even if it measures much better uh, than uh, what we can do, but why should we invest here in the development of the new instrumentation? Our competitors don't have anything else. We have the same as we have, and uh, just a waste of money. So this was for our development the so-called valley of death. And very often something like that happens. Because not only that the customer doesn't need it, the developer don't have the money, there is a wrong time, whatever. No? Most of the inventions uh, will fall into that valley of death and will not survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, our valley of death more or, la more or less lasted six years long. Mm -hmm. And in 2010, uh, there came uh, activity in the market because 2006, six, a US manufacturer who did not have these kind of electrochemical cells wanted to come, a huge company wanted to come on the market on water control, uh, fresh water, sewing water, whatever, yeah, uh, lakes and seas and so on. Yeah. He wanted to come on that market and because he did not have this kind of technology, he was looking for a new technology and found a group in the, in the United States. Uh, and together with this group, he developed such an optochemical sensor system. And then he came in the US market and kicked the other ones in their backside. Yeah? And then they uh, woke up, and for two of them it was too late. Yeah? They lost their market because of the US uh, competitor yeah? uh, had a, had a, was very strong, had enough money, did needed marketing and uh, captured the market. But now we have also transferred this into <coughs> license agreements and our centers are also produced. The principle of that system is that you evaluate, that you light, uh, you shine light on a, on a dye molecule and this dye molecule uh, sends back light with a different frequency. You can see that uh, on old men and women, uh, which go to the, to the hair cover and get their hair uh, shiny, uh, white hair. Uh, and then you see that this white hair has somehow a blue shine. Uh, and that is that phenomen <coughs> phenomenon that the nicely looking white hair uh, has get this impression by such a fluorescent dye uh, and uh, this dye shines back a little bit of the light in a frequency which is longer than the irradiation frequency and you can use that also for a sensing purpose and I show you a few examples for that at the end of my lecture yeah, what we have developed of course this is a developing instrument yeah, shining light on a packed good and in that packed good is some of this dye and this dye, these are two uh, LEDs shining light there and this dye then emits another light at another frequency huh? as it is sketched here mm -hmm. and you can, you can analyze this light and see without damaging the package how much oxygen is inside the package why is it interesting? Do you know it? How long, the food, uh, How long the food lasts? Because if you look at the package, yeah, in German it's uh, unter Schutzgas atmosphere, a protecting atmosphere. Yeah? I do not know in English it's a, a modified atmosphere packaging. Yeah? And almost everything which is packed 
is packed under such an atmosphere. But uh, the, the, the food distributors, the big supermarkets, don't want that because they, uh, they are afraid that uh, by, by law they may be forced to have such kind of investigation possibilities in their, in their market and each person can come, hold the good under such an instrument and the instrument will say yes it's okay or not. Uh, so they don't want it but it's a, a nice example. Then you see this was the very first instrument, yeah. this is the second generation and that's what now sold yeah, on, on the market. Another example for these sensors, no? this is one of the mature sensors which we have produced and here on the front side you see this red dye yeah. and that is now uh, one of the production models yeah, which is produced and going into the beverage market. Yeah. That's what I wanted to show you. What is the, the moral of the story or what should we learn? Let's create many things together mm -hmm. based on innovative ideas. So thank you for your attention.